Hey you guys, I'm continuing the series on how famous preachers use subtlety to corrupt the simplicity of the gospel. Again, I'd like to remind you, this is not an attack on any person. This is not a personal attack against the preacher. This isn't saying they're not saved. This isn't saying they're evil. We're just saying the gospel they preached is accursed on a double curse by St. Paul because it is another gospel. Uh, the real gospel is simply the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures that we trust in for eternal life because it was his blood offered on the mercy seat of heaven that paid for our sin debt. He restored what Adam lost. That's why our works can't be involved because only he could do that. Once he restored that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with our performance. Now, once we are saved, it is our reasonable service. Paul begs them to present their bodies a living sacrifice, which is their reasonable service. I'm constantly saying that grace doesn't teach us that. The mercy of God teaches us to love him and serve him. So it's really silly because the strength of sin is the law that people keep trying to bring pieces of the law into the gospel. Uh, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Now, when I went through this Bible, I mean, when I went through this book, rather, uh, I did skip several of them. I'm going to go back because everybody keeps on, what about Billy Graham? He preached at false gospel. Well, I haven't forgot him. I have skipped Beth Moore, James Dobson, Ray Comfort, and Kirk Cameron, and a couple other pastors, just to, and Franklin Graham, to get to Billy Graham for you in this series. Uh, again, uh, I'm not saying they're not saved. I think uh, Billy Graham could have been a man of God. I, I don't know. A lot of people say he was rubbing elbows with the Pope and he was a Freemason. I don't know about all that. Only God knows. Okay, this isn't my point. My point here, because I'm going to get tons of men, well, he was a Freemason and he did this, and then I'll get the opposite side. Billy Graham was a man of God. How dare you? I'm not speaking against him personally. Okay? Again, this is to show you their gospel presentation versus the simplicity in Christ in the Bible. Christ's gospel presentation. All right, we are reading from Michael Bowen's book called I Never Knew You. He has no problem with us sharing that. So we're going to go to the plan of salvation according to Billy Graham. It says in the whole of, uh, by the way, I just want to let you know, Billy Graham got his preaching style word for word from a man named Billy Sunday, who was a big revivalist, like a tent revivalist in the 1950s. Okay, but if you listen to Billy Sunday, Billy Graham almost says exactly the same thing in the exact same way. See, one false prophet will learn from another false prophet, and then he'll propagate it. And then they'll get proselytes, and it says to make them twice as son of hell as themselves. Doesn't, I'm not saying he is that, okay? I'm just saying what he preached is false, and so was Billy Sunday's gospel false. And they used to call it the sawdust trail, where you'd be in these tent revivals, and they'd have mud, so they put down sawdust so you wouldn't slip and fall. And they talk about walking down the sawdust trail. Like, I think uh, Ralph Inky Honors tells you about this, maybe. Maybe he tells you. Anyway, uh, and so you walk down the aisle, and you make a public proclamation and say some sinners praying you saved. And that's not true at all. All right? So I just wanted to let you know that's where he got it from. So he didn't make it up. He learned false teaching from another false teacher. All right. In the whole of modern Christendom, perhaps no other personality is more recognizable than that of the evangelist Billy Graham. Let me just say something. The world loved him. The world loves Billy Graham. You say one bad thing about him, they'll jump on you. That scares me. The world shouldn't love you if you're standing for the true gospel. Why? Because it's very narrow. It's saying that only Jesus saves. And in the end of his life, Billy Graham was saying you could be a Muslim or a Buddhist or even an atheist and be part of the body of Christ and not know it because he's called you. What? What? That's nonsense. <sighs> anyway, so for decades, Graham was delivered. He's delivered his message to millions of spiritually hungry people all over the world through radio, television, books, a popular ministry, ministry magazine, and by filling stadiums and arenas to maximum capacity. Graham is perhaps the best-known Christian personality of all time apart from Christ himself. 
As such, perhaps no other personality is sought so fervently to persuade and to influence our views concerning salvation from God's wrath against sin. Graham, with his intense gaze and authoritative voice, mesmerizes his audience with statements that strike at the very core of each attentive individual. His sermons from decades ago are still on broadcast today on popular Christian networks across the world. Uh, the free gospel of grace, people hate it because it makes them equal with the lowest sinner and they hate it. How dare that lowly sinner get saved and I'm so good and they're not. How dare they be saved? It is very offensive. People don't get that. Paul talked about how the offense of the cross would cease if he just add one work like circumcision. So people could glory in something. I'm saved because Jesus died, plus I got circumcised. I did the work. See, when you take that away from people, the pride is crushed. And they don't realize it. And they'll fight to the death for the false gospel they've been taught. And that's very, very sad. So he says, uh, when you click on his website, How to Know Jesus, it's a link at the Billy Graham Evangelical Association, I believe is what the BGEA stands for. Uh, he says he's going to paraphrase as accurately as he can what his plan of salvation is. So this is what step one, Billy Graham says. You're told that God loves you and he wants you to have an abundant life both now and forever. That's true. And the question is raised to get you to ponder deeply as to why most people do not have the abundance or peace that God originally planned for us to have in this life. Well, I believe that is because we know we're lost without Christ. And then... Once you're in Christ and you receive forgiveness through his shed blood, you do have peace because you know where you're going. Why? Because it's not about you. It's about work that was done 2,000 years ago. See, it's Jesus' work. If you try to add your work to that, you've canceled it. God's not going to accept that contract. The only contract he's going to accept for your sin is his son's shed blood. And if you add something to that, that's another contract. That cancels the deal. I do not frustrate or nullify or cancel the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. All right? So step two, we're told of our sinful condition and how our free will has led us away from God. He talks, and this is all true, he talks about how our sins have created a gap between us and God, and we cannot bridge that gap between us and God, no matter how many good works we do. That's absolutely true, too. And see, there's so much truth here, and they're going to twist it just a little bit, like they're going to redefine what the word repent means. Instead of them saying, Repentance means for salvation now. For salvation. Once you're saved, there's all kinds of repentance that we do in our lives. We get rid of sin once we're saved because it's just not who we are anymore. All right? But that takes time and it's about growing in grace through the milk of the word. That's a mature Christian. That's not salvation. Salvation has nothing to do with your performance. It's receiving God's uh, Jesus' payment to the Father on your behalf. That's it. It has nothing to do with you at all. So you're going to see there's a lot of truth here, but you're going to see where they add our works to it. All right? And so step three, we're told that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, that Christ bridged that gap between us and God by paying the penalty for our sins. That's true. That God has provided us only one way to him, and we must make a choice. Okay. There it is. It's a free gift. Receive it. Fine. In step four, we are told that we must trust Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior by personal invitation. That's not true. You will see nowhere in Scripture where you have to make a personal invitation for God to enter your life. The way he does enter your life is you put your trust. It tells us in Ephesians, we heard the gospel of our salvation. We believed in whom we trusted. We were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. So, once you do trust in him, then the seed of Christ is then you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and now you do know him. So you don't have to invite Jesus into your life. He's already told you how to do that. I'll be in your life when you receive me. As many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you don't have to make an invitation that's totally false, okay? You won't see that anywhere, all right? Any kind of salvific verses, any, any instances where someone's being saved, like the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. God didn't lie. He didn't leave anything out. Okay? Then it's Philip and the eunuch. Hey, what prevents me from being baptized? If you believe with all thine heart thou mayest, boom, he got baptized. Why? Because he believed. And he was saved when he believed. It has nothing to do with inviting him as your Savior and Lord. 
you must admit you're a sinner. Well, obviously, if you didn't admit you're a sinner, then you couldn't accept payment for sins you committed. Then be willing to turn from your sins. The redefinition, the English definition of repentance, and not the original Greek word. We, we got to look at the Bible by what they meant when they spoke. The translation is metanoia. That is the Greek word it's translated from. It means change of mind. And you can change your mind about anything. Can you change your mind about sin? Absolutely. Does the verses tell you that? Absolutely not. Because sin is transgression of the law. If you have to turn from sin, then you have to stop breaking God's law, which is keeping the law. It has nothing to do with you keeping the law. Salvation is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, saved us by the washing of regeneration, renewing the Holy Ghost. So, that's false. You have to make an invitation. Then he says you have to be willing to turn from your sins. Repent. Of your sins. You won't find that verse anywhere in the King James Bible at all, any place. For salvation, for nothing. You won't find it anywhere. It's a made up quote. It is not in the Bible at all. So, and we've heard it so much, we believe that's what it means. All right? Then you believe Jesus died on the cross. So, where is the focus in the salvific message? On you. You living right. You changing your life you stop being bad and start being good and jesus died for you too hmm sounds like the focus is on you and your behavior change doesn't it because it is what is that works this is works salvation plain and simple billy graham preaches another gospel which is a cursed double cursed anathema according to saint paul so, he's telling you you have to make an invitation, you have to change your, you repent of your sins, you have to stop being bad, start being good, all right, which nobody is, nobody's good. Then, lastly, you believe on Jesus, and then, through a sinner's prayer, which is nowhere in the Bible, invite Jesus to come and control your life through the Holy Spirit by making him your Lord. Now, uh, John MacArthur has a thing, well, submit your life to the Lordship of Christ. Works, works, works. What does that mean? Keep the commandments. Works, works, works. Law. Okay, are we against serving God? Are we against? Am I against it? Absolutely not. I serve him the best I can every day. I try to be a good example to others. I have my flaws. I'm honest about my flaws. I'm not a pastor. I don't have some standard I have to live up to. But I do my best every day to live according to the love of Christ in my life. And to... Uh, present myself a living sacrifice so that um, I can set myself aside and put others first and be uh, uh, and be kind. And when you do that and you keep your eyes on Jesus, you won't murder, you won't commit adultery, you won't lie, right? So uh, the, the way to fulfill the law is by loving, okay? So, but we don't, we don't look at the dead letter of the law because that can't save us, you see? Christ is of no effect to you, whosoever you are justified by the law. You've fallen from grace. So he's given you a false plan of salvation. He starts out good. God loves you. He wants a relationship. Of course he does. He wants to bring you back into his family. Absolutely. He wants to restore what Adam lost. And the last Adam came and fixed all that. And see, it's only Jesus' blood contract that the Father will accept. Alexa, please stop. Please stop. Um, the, uh, the only thing he'll accept is the blood of Christ. Not you trying to be good. That has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, and people say that it just feels right to get up out of their seats because he asked people to walk down the aisle. And that's where he got it from. Billy Sunday. He got it from Billy Sunday in these tent revivals. So now he, he used, makes it applicable to these big stadiums that he would get into. And he'd invite hundreds or even thousands of people to come and walk down the aisle and make a commitment and a decision for Christ. All right, first of all, I do agree with my brother that God must give you repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. God has to persuade you, and the only way you're persuaded is through the Word of God. Faith come by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you notice with the Philippian jailer, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And then it says that Paul and Silas preached Jesus Christ and him crucified. Obviously, just like we've seen in other examples, when Peter's talking to the Jews and to Cornelius, 
He explains them in the scriptures, the prophecies Jesus fulfilled, and then showed them how his death, burial, and resurrection was prophesied hundreds of years before. Okay? Even thousands. So, uh, that confirmed, and the word of God persuaded them, they believed, and they were saved and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Uh, so you can't make yourself believe it. Okay? You can't force yourself to... The word of God persuades us. All right? So, you get these people to come down and say they feel right. They get an emotional experience. Oh, I'm going to make a decision to stop being bad. I'm going to stop drinking beer every Friday night and Saturday night. And I'm going to be good. And then they don't, they're blind to the other sin in their life, like pride and fear and worry. That's, you know, whatever is not a faith is sin. And sin of omission and preaching preach on false gospel. That's a huge sin. Uh, and But they're blind to it because they think now they're good because they stopped doing the big sins in their life, they think. You know, and that's the deception. Uh, and again, it's the deception of living the Christian lifestyle and never being born again. Why? Because you, you don't receive the Holy Spirit unless all your trust is in the work of Jesus and none of yourself. Okay? that That's really scary to me. So a lot of people aren't saved because they feel good. All right? One day at the age of seven, after our pastor of our little church preached his sermon in the choir saying, Just as I am, the very same song that is sung by Billy Graham's choir at the end of every service. And that song basically says you come to the cross just like you are. He receives you, he forgives you, and he makes you clean, and you're saved because you trust in him at the cross. But yeah, Billy Graham's going to add invitations, walking down the aisle, public proclamation, confession, uh, turning from sin, stop being good, start being, stop being bad, start being good, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of, uh, being dunked in water a lot of times, uh, they add. All right, so... Uh, he said, I got out of the pew and walked forward the same way my friend walked forward earlier, only a week before. You see, my friend had recently walked down the front the same way all those folks did at the end of Graham's sermons. A few days later, I saw my friend get dunked in water. I wanted to be just like my friend, and because I always saw so many people go forward at the end of Graham's shows, I assumed that I should do the same thing, yet I never knew what salvation was all about. A lot of these people don't even understand the simple plan of salvation. They just go down and say, yes, I am a sinner. And they get, I'm going to stop being bad and start being good. Nevertheless, they're not saved. Never get saved. It says, each of them came up and shook my hand at the end of the service because he got approval. He had done the right thing. It felt right in his heart. He went up there and he did that. About a week later, he was fitted for a baptismal robe and told to walk up the stairs to the pool. He waited in the water, looking outward at the approving audience sitting in the church. The pastor lifted his right hand, said some holy-sounding words that I didn't understand at all. Then he submerged my little body into the water and raised me up. I exited the pool of water, went back down to uh, back into a room, changed in my clothes, and scampered quickly to the pew upon which my family sat in order to live into our pastor's sermon. Listen to the pastor's sermon. I remember feeling very happy about what I'd done, although I had no idea what I had done. I made sure my son understood what he did at his baptism. It was his choice. He did it with his father, praise God, a few months before he died. He knew what he was doing. He was making a public proclamation that he is saved and belongs to Christ, and that means technically he died and was buried and rose again with Jesus and should walk in newness of life because of that, and that the border baptism was a symbol of the true baptism into Christ, which is the Holy Spirit baptism that we all have once we are saved uh, by simple faith in the finished work of the cross. You should never baptize a child unless he decides and he understands that he is saved because of faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone, and that baptism is a symbol of that. Uh, because otherwise, it's worthless, and you see it right here. He had no idea why. He had no idea why. Uh, so he also would sing uh, the song, Into My Heart, that essentially was a way of asking Christ into your heart, even though none of us really understood what that meant. But deep down, it felt right, and it felt holy. Okay, see, Satan is a minister of right. Satan. Satan's ministers are ministers of righteousness. Uh, you can keep asking Jesus into your heart and never be born again. It's not like that. That's not biblical, people. We have to go. You, you hear these things so much in the churches, and then you'll look in the Bible, and it's nowhere in there. Nowhere. Surrender your life to be saved. Surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Give your life to Christ. Nowhere will you see any of that. Why? Because you're saved because Christ gave his life for you, not because you gave your life to him. Once you're saved and you decide, okay, I'm going to just turn my life over to Christ, he's going to crucify it. 
That's what he's going to do with your life. But you giving it to him isn't going to save you. So it's just crazy that there's so many false plans of salvation. The world loves them. And then when you tell them the Bible way to salvation, they come and call you names. Easy believism. You just love sin. Because they don't realize the strength of sin is the law, which is why they're struggling in their sin and they're blind to it. They can't see their own sin. But grace, grace, the goodness of God teaches sin makes men uh, repent. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's not law. You see so many people angry because they think God is forcing them to not have fun or to stop doing this or because they don't get it. You know, it's so sad that basically Billy Graham's message it's all about what you do. It's all about you not being bad anymore and deciding to start being good and living your life for God. That's not salvation. That is not biblical salvation. You've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit in you to even do anything good. If you're not abiding in the vine, you can't do anything good because all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You can't please God in your flesh. You can't do it. The way you please God is to take Him at His word. That he gives us eternal life, and that life is in his son. All right? That's how you believe. So basically, to sum up Billy Graham's false gospel message is, you have to stop being bad and start being good. Not to mention the walking down the aisle, the sinner's prayer, the inviting me into your heart, and all other such unbiblical nonsense that all these people see and copy in their churches. Okay, why aren't we using just what the Bible says and that standard and start copying what Paul and Silas did with the Philippian jailer? Start copying what Philip did with the eunuch. Start copying what Peter did with Cornelius. These are all Gentile believers. They're shown the scriptures and how Jesus fulfilled them and says because of this payment, your sins are forgiven. Now, repentance unto life is to turn to trusting in what Christ did and stop trusting in your own dead works of the law and trust in the finished work of the cross. And when you do that, the Holy Spirit's in you, then he'll start working in you, right? And then you get in the Word and you have somebody help you be discipled, okay? That's the process. You don't pile up all the discipleship into the gospel message. Okay, so he continues on. And he says, Billy often refers to the Greek word for repent, which is metanoia, which he erroneously defines as turning away from our sins or to feel sorry for sin. That's metamalami, by the way. There is a word for that. That we should change our minds about sin and walk away from it altogether as a requirement for being born again. That's your works. No, you'll never be born again adding a work to that gospel. I can tell you that right now. You'll never have security. And good thing you don't because you wouldn't have been saved. You need to feel insecure unless you trust the finished work of Christ. And if you do feel insecure, you the gospel is the prescription. All right. So he says what they're saying that we that very often as a way of telling us that we have to quit willfully and deliberately sinning in order to be born again. He will refer to where Jesus in Luke 13 said we must repent or perish. And by the way, that verse is not even about eternal life. It's about some Galileans who died in an accident when a tower fell on them. And these self-righteous men thought the reason they died is because they were worse sinners than they are. I didn't die in that accident because I'm not a sinner like them. And Jesus is rebuking them. You think those guys died because they were worse of a sinner than all the people in Galilee? I tell you nay. But unless you repent, you'll die just like they did. It's about physical perishing. Physical death. It has nothing to do with eternal death. It's just ridiculous when people take verses out of context like that. Anyway, it, it, the, even the word Jesus used there was change your mind. Change your mind about that self-righteousness that you have. Uh, fourthly, he says that we must come to Christ by faith in order to receive his free gift, but the free gift has all these qualifiers you got to do. It's not a free gift. It's all this stuff you got to do to get it which makes it not a free gift. Free gift to everlasting life we cannot earn by our works or our service, although he does tell you to get it by works. 
because now you got to stop being bad and start being good. You got to start keeping the law because sin is transgression of the law. So to repent of sin, it means to repent of breaking God's law or to keep God's law. It's the same thing, just sneaky way of adding the law and works to the gospel, which cancels it so you never get born again. Bam! Do you see how Satan did that? Mm-hmm. Sure seems right to man, though. At this point in his preaching, we will very often quote John 3.16, which states that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone, which directly contradicts everything he said up to that point. <laughs> Do you see the craziness here? Wait a minute. It's a free gift. For God so loved the word he gave his only gotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But believe means to stop being bad, start being good. Ask him into your heart, walk down an aisle, make a public proclamation. All that stuff he's telling you to do, which is your works, and it's about you and what you're doing. So, <laughs> he says, it directly contradicts. He, he quotes this, tells you it's free, which directly contradicts everything he said up to that point. He will also give other verses, such as Titus 3, 5, which states, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy he saves us. And this is why salvation, according to Billy Graham's, becomes so complicated and so very confusing to the lost people who have come to Billy and learn how to be saved. Billy says we can't earn our salvation no matter what we do, no matter how many good deeds we do. But isn't stop being bad and start being good, good works? Absolutely. Isn't that not sinning? Not breaking God's law? Keeping the law? Absolutely. But immediately afterwards, he tells everyone they must change their behavior, submit their wills to Christ, and stop sinning. Nobody's ever done that. It's an impossible standard. He gives verses that tells us to believe on Christ alone and salvation is a free gift given to us the instant we believe, such as John 3.16, Ephesians 2.8.9, yet he turns right around and says we must make a 180 degree change in our direction. It takes a lot of effort on our part to do these things and that we should determine with all of our efforts to follow Christ. People, that's discipleship and not salvation. And adding that and service and discipleship and doing this and stop being bad and start being good. That's works. It's added to the gospel. It's contradiction. Is God the author of confusion? You should know flat out that God is not the author of confusion. So if you get a gospel message that's not Christ-centered, but you-centered, but tells you it's a free gift, you can't earn it no matter what, then tells you all the stuff you got to do to earn it. Come on, people. It's not of God. It's not of God if it's confusing. Paul said, I come to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. That's what I tell you. Nothing. Why? Because that's the only thing that saves you. It's the only way you're born again. Unless you put your trust all in what he did and none of what you do, you're not saved. I don't care how good a Christian life you're living. That's the trick of the devil. Go ahead and live the Christian life and still drop into hell. It's crazy. All right. He then says that we don't have the power to follow Christ unless the Holy Spirit enables us to do so. And that's true. But you won't get it through his gospel. So what you're going to get is a lot of will worship. Taste not, touch not, handle not. You get a new release of life. So I'm going to really get busy and dig down deep and use my willpower to stop these things. But it's not the power of the Holy Spirit. It's you. It's you. And you get this changed life and you think you're saved now. You're not. AA changes your life. You need the Holy Spirit. Billy demands again and again that we must quit sinning in order to be saved. But directly afterwards, he rotates back and forth from quit sinning to, quote, you can do nothing of yourself to earn it. He says salvation is free, but immediately afterwards says you must carefully consider the cost of following Christ. The cost is opposite of free, people. It's either free or it costs you something. Which one is it? It's confusion, and it's not of God. God says eternal life's a free gift. It's not of works. It's for him that worketh not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, not those that try to stop being bad and start being good. His faith is counted for righteousness. As Abraham believed God and is counted to him for righteousness. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's not of yourselves. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. If you believe on me, you have everlasting life. He who believes the Son has life. He who believes not the Son has not life. And the wrath of God abides on him. God is very clear about his salvific message. It's not free and cost you at the same time. What's happening here? They're not dividing salvation from salvation, uh, discipleship and service. You have to divide it. John MacArthur does the same garbage. Ray Comfort, the same garbage. 
It's like one false teacher following another false teacher and the blind leading the blind leading the blind and nobody's saved. It's just ridiculous. Why am I here fighting for the true gospel? And it's crazy because so many claiming Christ come against it and mock it and hate it and do videos proclaiming that it's wrong. It's easy believism. When is receiving a free gift supposed to be hard? Jesus did all the work. Come to me, y'all, ye who are laboring or heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We've ceased from our works as God did from his. We have entered into his rest. That's salvation. Pick up your cross and follow me and count the cost. It's, it's discipleship, not salvation. If it's free, it doesn't cost you. Come on. Billy says that Christ will not acknowledge you before his father if you don't acknowledge him before other, which in context means you will not go to heaven unless you tell other people you made some decision for Christ. Completely out of context, that verse. I don't have time to explain it here, but it's another work he tells you you got to do. Public confession. That's why you got to run down the aisle. Hypothetically speaking, how would you feel if you were in a car with someone the likes of whom I'm about to describe? Imagine you're trying to get somewhere you've never been before and the person says, okay, take a left and then take a right and then stop. Back up, take another right, wait, take another left. My map is correct, trust me, stop, go right again, then turn left. Can't you go any faster? Okay, turn right, no, wait, stop, take a left, then take another left, wait, 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 go back, go back. Can't you do anything right? Start over, start over, okay, right, left, sharply right, now stop. Can't you follow my directions? Back up and take another right. Wait, go left. Trust me, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm taking you. That reader is the sad yet accurate equivalent of the plan of salvation according to Billy Graham. It will get you nowhere. Again, it's full of confusion, people, and double talk, and it's nonsense. There is an increasing number of evangelicals today who are preaching that in order for a man to be saved, that he must not only receive Christ as the Savior, but must also make him absolute Lord and Master of his life. When you trust in him, he is your Lord. Now, your obedience to him being your Lord is a separate matter after you're saved. Now, that's your fellowship with the Lord. That's your spiritual maturity. But that has nothing to do with the, you getting saved, that you have to make some promise to be good and to follow him. That's discipleship. And it's a lie anyway. He doesn't want it. It's a lie because you're not going to do it perfectly. And see, when you do that, now you're looking at how well you follow Jesus as if you're saved or not. Okay, if I'm not really following him, am I really saved? Okay, but see, your foundation must be on Christ alone. It's his blood that makes you worthy. It's his blood. His death, burial, and resurrection is what gives you eternal life. Why? Because it paid the sin debt. It fixed what Adam screwed up. That's why it says through one man's disobedience, we have death. All die. Through one man's obedience, Christ, all live. So you either believe that through his obedience you have eternal life, his obedience unto the cross and his suffering. And if you don't, you spit on the cross. You mock his suffering. You say, it's not enough. You need my works. I'm going to add this. I got to do this. And it's insulting to the cross. It's insulting to his suffering. But you can't see it because it seems so right to your mind to add the law, to add good works to it. It's like you had some qualifier to it. It's, it's crazy. How, how, how many people see that it's clear in Scripture that it's not of works, it's not of yourselves, it's by grace, which is undeserved, and you can't earn it. Then it says if you add any works to it, it cancels grace, but yet people insist on adding some kind of works, a qualifier to it. I just, I don't understand it. We would agree that all those quitting sins and bad habits is the right thing to do. And that following Christ and doing the things that he says to do is the right an honorable way to live in every case and situation we might find ourselves in. But quitting your sins and bad habits as well as following Christ to the best of your ability are not part of God's simple plan of salvation. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying don't do those things. I'm saying they're not part of what saves you, so don't trust in them. Because for one, it's about you. And you won't do it perfectly. Two, if you add that to the gospel... You're not saved. All right? It doesn't work. Do those things, but understand they're not saving you, okay? You should get saved first, and then the Holy Spirit will help you do those things effectively as you grow, okay? But you can't add them to the gospel, okay?
As good as the Christian lifestyle is, no aspect of it is included in God's salvation contract with humankind. Again, God's not going to accept that for the contract. The wages of sin is not repentance. The wages of sin is not trying to be good. The wages of sin is death, and Christ paid that for you. You see? All right. We don't want to mix that up. Ephesians 2, 1 says, And have you he hath quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We see that believers who are quickened or made alive, that's why it's quickened the dead, living in the dead, through faith in Christ, were, quote, dead in their sins before the Holy Spirit brought them to a saving knowledge of Christ. Quite literally, a dead person, one who's spiritually dead, cannot help themselves. They can't turn from their sins because they don't have the power to do so. They might think they're getting rid of some stuff through some willpower, but the sin is still in their heart, if they, even if they're abstaining. God gives people the power to walk according to his principles only after a person is born again. The person must be born again before he or she is able to consciously start getting rid of that in your life. But it's not like, I'm going to look at these sins and get rid of them. No, you're looking at Jesus, and so you're not even thinking about that stuff. Most of the time, we still fail. We fight the flesh daily. So it's crazy to tell somebody that, see, your, your sin is here, <laughs> still in it. Thought, word, and deed, still say You can't turn from your flesh. You're still in it. That's why Paul said, the good that I would, that I don't think I hate, that I do. Who saved me from this body of death? There's no more I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. And he thanks God that one day he'll be free from this body of death. All right? Billy Graham and the majority of pastors today make turning from sins an essential element in salvation. When the Bible states outright that those who are dead in their sins don't even have the power or desire to quit those sinful things that bring them joy. For example, you can't even ask a person to start liking things that God wants, loving things that God loves you, without the Holy Spirit. It's just crazy to tell an unsaved person to do these things. It's crazy. Billy Graham says he must stop his drinking in order to be saved. Yet, because he can't stop drinking, he gives up all hope of ever coming to Christ for salvation. That's what happened to me. You got to repent of your sin, Jed. I was wrapped in heroin addiction. Every time I tried to quit, I'd throw up and sweat and feel like I was going to die. So, I got that. Nice slits and stitches up both wrists. That's the false gospel. Why? Because those of us that are honest enough to realize we're wrapped in bondage, we can't stop them. And so we need Christ. We need to come to him just as we are. And then once he does save us, he opens doors. He opened doors for me to get medical help. And it took time. But I was not able and I thought that unless I could stop that sin, I was unaware of all the other sin I had, like deep inside, just like these people are. Because they lower the standards of the law, thinking they're keeping it. But see, that kept me from coming to Jesus at first. Praise God, I got the real gospel. And then he started to work on me. These people are putting the cart before the horse. And he says, they're going to sing, just as I am, I come without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve. Because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Confused, the drunkard gives up and walks away feeling all the more defeated because he can't live up to Billy Graham's standard, which he is led to believe are God's standards. However, if the unfortunate alcoholic was to hear the true plan of salvation according to Christ, he could relieve, receive instantly the gift of everlasting life, the very same moment he believes Jesus paid for his sins by his death on the cross, he was buried and he walked out of the grave alive three days later. How can we know this is true? Because the Bible says so. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. First Thessalonians 4.14 4, And Jesus said very plainly, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hold on one second. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And let me tell you, my Lord, did not lie about that. And one of the most potent verses of all time that refutes Billy's turn from sin requirement is this one. And by him all that believe are justified from all things which you cannot be justified by the law of Moses. The ten? Yeah, the ten too. Okay? The ten just shows you how you don't keep them so that you need a savior. 
What the Bible is telling us through these verses is that turning from sins cannot save us and that God does not require a lost person to turn from his sins in order to be saved. So we must ask ourselves this question. Why does Billy Graham tell us we must repent of our sins in order to be saved? That's a question I've asked myself repeatedly ever since I realized he was wrong and that Christ was right. Uh, he probably heard from another preacher. I think he copied it from Billy Sunday. I cannot explain the reasons for which Billy feels his great need to ignore what Christ has said so clearly and to instead add works to God's grace. I believe Billy is not so aware of what metanoia really means. Yet I'm in no way insinuating he's ignorant of the meaning. I just believe that Satan will not allow him to understand it because, quote, if our gospel be hid, it be hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world is blind at the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And what scares me is there's so many claiming them, and I know they're lost. I know they're lost. And I try and I fight, and I try to make them see it, and I can't. God's got to do it. And I worry because they come on here and accuse me. As a matter of fact, I got one or two people, all those thumbs downs, it's just one or two people with tons of sock accounts. And they automatically dislike over and over again using every one of their channels to try to keep it down. Because they hate the gospel. They can't see it. They hate me because I'm preaching the gospel. They think it's me they hate. And they might hate me. They might think they don't like me personally. But I really think it's the spirit working through them. I really do. He says, simply put, the only logical conclusion to which I can arrive is an attempt to answer the question is that Satan has blinded him to the truth about salvation the way the aforementioned verse suggests. That's the only thing I can think of, too. Billy requires a lost person to feel extremely sorry for his or her sins. And the fact of the matter is, is that a lost sinner is most likely not sorry for their sins. Rather, they kind of enjoy him very much. So you're asking a lost person to do something he can't do. The Greek word for repent is simply change your mind. And we all need to change our mind from trusting in ourselves to trusting in Christ. Because we all fall short. Now, I've done something on, I've done a whole series on repent and I'm going to do some more. I'm going to explain that word every in every verse it's used. I've done some of the major ones on there uh, to explain what the word means in context. But it's really sad because I'm, I don't even need to do... He's got a chapter on his son, Franklin Graham, in here. And it's identical. I mean, there's, there's nothing different. He, he preaches the same thing uh, that his dad did. 1 John 5.13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. We don't have to hope or guess, people. We can know. We know now. I'm so sorry this is long, but Billy Graham was a big one, and it needed to be addressed. And I believe a lot of false preachers today who hold Billy Graham up on this pedestal have copied him, like Ray Comfort. I even think John MacArthur might have gotten some uh, motivation from him because he's the make Jesus the Lord of your life, submit your will to him. And that's the same thing Billy Graham did, who he got it from Billy Sunday. And as you can see, it's false teacher to false teacher getting it. Again, I'm not trying to put these men down personally. I'm just telling you the message they give you is not the promised, simple salvation message that Jesus and his word gives us which is to put our trust in our Savior and none of ourselves. All right, God bless you guys.